and I've been fortunate enough to now have 36 of former employees become either a CIO, a CTO, or, or a CISO. I think it's probably my best accomplishment in my lifetime is, is building other leaders. Hi, I'm Alex Henson, and welcome to another episode of Legends of Employee Experience. Throughout this series, I'm talking to business and transformation leaders who are making a difference in the world of employee experience. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Patrick Thompson. Patrick is the CIO and Chief Digital Transformation Officer at Albemarle Corporation, one of the leading suppliers of lithium to the electric vehicle industry. Patrick has been in the role since 2017, Patrick, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to join you, Alex. Good to see you. Likewise. Now, of course, I can't start this conversation without addressing the fact that I was supposed to be there in person with you. I was very much looking forward to having an in-person conversation, having done so many of these virtually. Um, I'm having to quarantine right now, uh, but it's amazing to see you sat there in my chair um, <laughs> doing the role that I normally do. I do feel a little bit like you're about to interview me right now. Hopefully the team have been looking after you. Well, Alex, I'm enjoying your chair. It's very nice. You look right at home. So Patrick, um, I want to get back to Albemarle, which is one of these companies that's not on a lot of people's radar, but is playing a huge role in a very, very transformative industry right now. So I want to talk about that, but I want to start somewhere a little bit different. Last time you and I spoke, you shared an insight with me uh, that I found super interesting, which is that many, many people who have worked in your teams and under you as a CIO have gone on to become CIOs in, in and of their own right. Um, can you share a little bit about that story? Sure, Alex. Um, I think you're referencing um, over my lifetime, I've had an opportunity to employ a lot of IT professionals in my career. And as part of that, um, I kind of pride myself on developing those leaders for to be future leaders. I think that's what leaders really do. And I've been fortunate enough to now have 36 of former employees become either a CIO, a CTO, or, or a CISO. Um, and I think it, it really just stems from the fact when you invest in people and you take time uh, to spend with them in their development, um, and you focus on customer centricity as well as employee centricity. Um, people learn that culture and they bring it to other places and it affords them great opportunities to uh, elevate uh, up to a C-level um, position in a company. And I've been fortunate enough to watch 36 of my really good friends become CIOs or CTOs or CISOs. So thank you for mentioning that. It's one of my I think it's probably my best accomplishment in my lifetime is is building other leaders. Yeah, it must be something you're incredibly proud of. It's just a, a phenomenal achievement. So congratulations on that. I think one thing I've observed through having a few of these conversations is that a lot of people who are in roles affecting employee experience broadly um, across the workplace tend to have a very strong perspective on what it takes to develop their own teams, their direct reports and, and their own organizations. So cur curious to get some thoughts from you on what it takes to be a, a great leader and how you think about developing uh, your own teams to such a level that they go on to perform as C-level executives um, at other companies. What's the, what's the secret behind that? Yeah, I think, I think the, the secret probably says easy does hard. Um, was the phrase I'd like to use. Um, but it, it really focuses in on what in your company, what's your mission with your customers. And in order to reach great customer excellence, you, you have to have employee excellence. In other words, if you just focus on the customer without in focusing in on the employee to deliver that great product or that great service, um, you're gonna miss, miss the target. And I think when you come into an organization from an IT perspective, a lot of people talk about alignment. Um, I like to talk about enablement, enablement of the strategy. Um, 
being customer centric, delivering customer solutions really makes a difference. And, and developing your employees to focus that way, that with that customer centri centricity mindset, I think is what sets you know, great CIO or IT leaders apart. So how do you think about communicating a, a vision and setting out a plan with your team? It's a very easy thing to say. How do you actually do it in, in the real world? You know, on an annual basis, um, we all are part of some performance management system or culture, P people wanting feedback on how to develop themselves or get to the next level. Um, I think taking personal uh, focus and, and, and being very intentional about setting goals on an annual basis um, so that your employees know exactly what they need to do year to year to get to their end goal or their career path is, is crucial to the success of that. That you don't take that lightly. It's not just a score on how you perform, but are you actually setting clear a clear set of goals on an annual basis that they can see that they're achieving towards that end game or that target that they're seeking. I think uh, investing pers in personal time and commitment into that and showing them that you care about their development to get them to the next level uh, is very important. Another trait that I've seen very common amongst leaders that I've spoken to on this show is that over the course of their careers, they've built up philosophies or, or mantras or uh, rules and laws that have helped them to be successful. What what has helped you in, in your career and any insights that you can share? Sure, I'll, I'll share an experience I had uh, early on in my career. I was, you know, traveling a lot, uh, doing projects for Accenture in my first seven years. So I was spending a lot of time on the road. So I was a sponge when it came to reading books. One book I ran across was the 21 uh, Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. And I just, I love the concept of his 21 laws, but they were his, you know, thinking of what the laws should be and just gained some great insight from that book. But then I, I walked away from that book saying, you know, I should really create some laws and some guiding principles of how I'm going to live my life and how I'm going to do my career. And so I just started over, over the years after I read books or watched movies or watched motivational speeches or listened to my kids or my mom or my dad, I would just take down notes and start creating these laws. Um, so I came up with the 20, law, 20 laws of leadership for me. Like if I'm going to be a great leader, I have to wake up every day and live these laws. I have to, you know, literally walk the talk. And so I created these laws and then I started applying that with my teams, my leadership team and asked them, well, why don't you create your laws? Here's my laws. Don't they, I don't want them to be yours. I'm just giving you an example, but won't you think about the things that inspire you to what kind of leader you want to be and ask yourself, are you walking that talk every day? Are you doing these things as a leader? And so um, I, I, you know, the 36 CIOs that are out there or CTOs, CISOs, um, they all have their laws of leadership and they're different than mine, you know, and they're walking their talk now. And it's just fun to see them every once in a while because they'll, you know, it's usually a little card that they have with them and they'll pop it out and say, look, I still got them. I still got these 20 I'm living by and uh, makes me certainly feel good that uh, someone's using that framework to help them. So, you know, I can't let this conversation end without asking you to share two or three examples of your, your laws of leadership. You bet. I'd start with, begin with the end in mind. That's, that's the first one. Um, I love that one because almost everything you're starting a goal with is where do you want to be in the end, right? How do, how do you, you know, work your way back to what steps does it take to get to that end? So the number one law is begin with the end in mind. Um, another one that I, I like is, is strive for the impossible, but do the possible. In other words, reach for the stars, but grab the moon, right? 
you know, don't reach for the moon and, and miss the opportunity to, to, to hit the moon in that particular case. And another one I got from Hoosiers, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched Hoosiers, but it's a basketball story. At the end of the game, all the players are looking around in the huddle and one kid steps up and says, you know, the score was, they were down by one point. The coach designs a play. And the next thing you know, the play's going to some player that doesn't have the confidence that he can make the shot. And one of the kids in the huddles stands up and says, I'll make it. And then he changes the play, gives it, gives the ball to the kid that says, I'll make it. And he steps up and he makes it. So there were moments in my life where I saw something in a movie, read a line in a book. And I said, that's who I want to be as a leader. I want to begin with the end in mind. I want to start every project knowing what we're going to do to accomplish that goal, right? I'm going to strive for the impossible and I'm going to do what's possible. So I'm going to stretch myself to the impossible, but I'm going to do the possible. And you know what? I'm going to step up and I'm going to make it. I'm going to make, I'm going to make that shot that's impossible. I'm going, to, I'm going to take that shot. I'm going to take the risk. You know, I'll put the team on my back. I'll do it. So those are just some examples. I, I love it. And it's clear to me how when you talk about starting with the end in mind for, for you, the end in mind was not just being a successful CIO, but being a great leader. And it's clear that throughout your career, you've developed very intently a lot of systems and frameworks and best practices and laws of leadership to help you incrementally move in that direction. So it, it's not really a surprise um, that you have had this amazing success nurturing 36 future executives by imparting that that wisdom with them. So I, I live in Silicon Valley. Clearly, you're, you're here um, almost visiting me. Um, <clears throat> OKRs and other goal setting frameworks are, of course, you know, very popular uh, in many companies, um, particularly here in Silicon Valley. So there's always a little bit of a, <clears throat> a debate around um, whether a, a tool can fix a bad process or whether you need to get the process in, in place first. But any perspective on, on how to think about that, especially with something like OKRs, which are which can be notoriously complex to instrument and implement well in an organization. Yeah, I, I think when you think about any systems, you always talk about, by definition, a system is not a technology, it's a people, a process, and a technology component. There's that triangle that we've all grown up in the IT industry to come to respect. Uh, back in the day when the consultants came out and did methodologies and process assessments, it was about how are you people trained? Do you have the right processes and do you have the right technology? Um, what, what I'm seeing with these platforms is a lot of people focus on lag results and that's a huge mistake. Um, what you need to focus on is lead metrics, things that are actionable and influenceable. In other words, if I've hit this lever, is it actually gonna move the rock up, right? So if your action items are lead metrics, that you take an action on something and it actually moves the lever, you're gonna be a more successful and you're not gonna be looking in the rear view mirror at lag results. Cause that all that is is a report card. That's just telling you how you did last month. That's not telling you what you are doing to move that needle. And lead metrics are very key in those particular platforms. A lot of people focus on lag results. They should focus on lead metrics. That's really interesting. As someone who spent you know, my career in, in sales and marketing, we talk a lot about leading indicators. And of course, for people in a sales role, the ultimate lagging indicator is revenue, but of course that's what people are compensated on and that's the ultimate measure of success. But when you think about leading indicators, the activities that might drive that result, uh, things like uh, meetings and pipeline generation, um, they're the things that are more eminently in your control in, in the short term. So how does that translate to an IT team? Uh, what, what would you look at as leading indicators as opposed to, to a lagging indicator? Yeah, so certainly um, in translation, I love the example that you just used on the sales side because that is a perfect one on revenue, sales calls. Sales calls are lead metrics. It moves the revenue. That's the lag result. In the IT world, um, I'll, I'll tell you maybe an example we're using with MoveWorks, right? So when we first started with MoveWorks, we had about a million dollars plus in outside 
help desk services. We basically outsourced our help desk. Um, our metrics were the number of incidents. Um, now you could look at that as a lag metric or a lead metric. How we converted those lead metrics in was what is the root cause analysis of those incidents. And once we got to the root cause, and then we could apply MoveWorks platform to provide those solutions that we were seeing consistently that were coming up in the help desk, we could drive that incident volume down and then our cost from over a million dollars on an annual basis of help desk support went down to 100,000. So the lag result was the cost, the budget, a million plus. What was the lead indicator? The incidents. What was the action? was what was the root cause of those incidents and then how did MoveWorks provide solutions that made it self-service oriented so that no one needed to call the help desk anymore. So there's a good example of lead to lag results. Yeah, I like it. It's, it's essentially the same process really of just backing up the, the chain a little bit and trying to find whatever is the, the piece at the start of the chain that you can impact the most that ultimately affects um, the business metric, the revenue, the cost, the risk, et cetera. So going back to the 36 employees, um, talking about things like performance metrics, um, did you have any insight at the time that you were nurturing and developing these employees that they would go on to do what they did? Is there, is there some signal that you see in people that tells you this person has the potential to be a future leader? I, at the time, I didn't really set out to achieve that um, goal or, or set of targets. Um, I was trying to create cultures in all of the IT organizations that I was in a transformational opportunity with to develop people. And a lot of my development came from reading business books and, you know, um, setting personal goals, uh, not only for myself, but, you know, with my family. And just bringing those kind of practices into the business world of setting goals and then learning from others and applying what you learn in a case where you might, you might combine two frameworks. You might combine the balanced scorecard, which is a great strategy book by Kaplan and Norton, with a great execution book called 4DX, The Four Disciplines of Execution, written by Chris McChesney and Stephen Covey and then combine Jim Collins' Good to Great book. And then when you look at those three books and then create your fourth you know, uh, solution out of the three and then start applying that and teaching those principles and those frameworks to people, people start seeing a different development that they can just about achieve anything that you put in front of them. There's nothing, there's no, no task that ever comes before them that they don't feel like they have a tool in their tool bag that they can tackle strategy to execution to be good to great. So those, that's just one example is I used a lot of learnings from books and training and other platforms, execution platforms, and tried to teach those kind of skills with IT skills to make those IT professionals more valuable around business framework than IT framework. And I think that just took a natural course for them to want to be CIOs or C-level executives. And, and, and it had unfolded over 35 years. But nonetheless, uh, uh, there's 36 of them out there right now applying some of those frameworks themselves. So that's a really interesting insight because everything that you just talked about is less about IT and technology and lagging indicators of business success and more about skills and frameworks and systems to be successful in, I mean, presumably any role and, and any company. Um, do you, do you think all leaders operate that way or is that, a, is that a particular type of leader that takes the time to, to invest in their team that way? Yeah, I, I, I do believe today's, CIO or digital transformation officer has to be business oriented and have to, has to understand the business. Um, I don't think you can survive on IT skills alone in that role anymore. Um, the business is just too dependent on digitization 
and an enablement of automation. Um, in a lot of cases, in some cases, it becomes part of the business. <laughs> it's, it's not like it's just IT, but it is enabling uh, operational improvement, customer service improvement, supply chain improvement, uh, back office efficiencies. All of those terms are all business oriented things and, and to have some knowledge and experience in those business frameworks to bring automation to the, to, to the table I think is, you know, it's now foundational. You, you can't be in this seat any longer without those skill sets and without that framework uh, at your disposal. Do you think there are different levels of um, CIOs out there? Because I, I obviously have the pleasure of speaking to a lot of CIOs like you that are incredibly transformation, very business aligned in, in the way that they operate. I don't know that that's true of the entire industry. Um, how, how would you sort of categorize the different levels or the, or the career progression perhaps of, of a normal CIO? Yeah, I would, I would say there's you know, thousands of CIOs out there for sure. Uh, and they're probably at different stages of uh, evolution in their companies. Um, I would say a lot of CIOs start by being technical. Um, and, but in order to make the transformation, and usually when you, when you start getting to a scale of multi-billions do of dollars or mergers and acquisitions of large companies, uh, the, the, the scale starts requiring more of a business knowledge and a business experience. Whereas maybe uh, when you're starting with a small company, it's, you, you need more IT uh, skill sets um, as you get more and more complicated with mergers and acquisitions or larger volumes or global systems in nature or global footprints around the world. Your, your business knowledge becomes more valuable in those particular roles. Um, so, but a lot of those foundational technical CIOs that come up through the technical track eventually get that opportunity. They just need good mentors from CEOs and COOs to give them those opportunities to grow from a business framework perspective. But a lot of it has to do with yourself. You, you have to make an effort to want to learn the business. If you stay in your IT role and, and all you do is focus on becoming IT sharp, razor sharp, and not go out to the field, in the plants, with talk to the customers, the real customers, not your internal, but your external customers. If you don't make an effort to do those things, you're gonna stay in that role, that, that, that IT-centric role, and you're never gonna have a real seat at the table to help drive and enable business transformation. So it sounds like there's, there's a little bit of a balance of, particularly for leaders early in their career, perhaps earning the right to be credible in front of the business and, and getting the opportunity to work on revenue driving um, or, or transformational projects. Um, but what you said as well is that actually kind of starts from within. You've got to have the desire um, to push yourself into those kind of projects. Is, is that a fair reflection? Yeah, it is. It's a, a very good um, statement to if no matter what role you're in in CIO, understand what your company does and what your customers want. If you wake up every day and focus on delivering on customer solutions, both internal to your employees and external to your customers, and you're aligned with that, you're going to be very successful. If you ignore that, you're probably not going to be very successful. As we, um, as we think about Albemarle. So Albemarle is 28 years old at this point in time. Chemicals company based it based in North Carolina. Um, I'm just going to throw this out there, but historically probably not one of the companies that people would instantaneously go to as a good example of modern digital employee experience technology but the world that we live in today has kind of shifted what we all know about how companies run and operate um what can you tell us about albemarle and employee experience and the technology landscape there yeah so albemarle is definitely going through a transformation uh there's no doubt um it had an 
underinvested in IT for 20, uh, 20 plus years and was ranked number 20 in IT spend as a percentage of revenue. Now, depending on how you look at that, that's either really good, low cost, or really bad from an IT perspective. Um, in 2017, we uh, acquired uh, another very large company, a lithium-based company, which um, we're now number one market share in uh, providing lith lithium uh, specialty chemicals, carbonate and hydroxide for the electrical vehicle space. As a result of that, we definitely started making lots of investments in IT transformation and digital transformation. But we did that very smartly by aligning it with the Albemarle Way of Excellence operational strategy. So our new CEO, Kent Masters, came in in 2020 and set a clear direction on the strategy, the business strategy, but knowing that we needed to invest in IT uh, to enable and digitize that business. Uh, but it was the business strategy that drove the digital decisions and the acceleration. COVID just happened to help us accelerate it even faster. You know, the people were working from home, so they couldn't go to the help desk area or they couldn't have the IT guy come to their desk or, um, you know, couldn't get that personal touch support. So we needed to substitute that with something powerful that was self-service oriented, ask a question, get an answer. You know, less than one or two or three clicks and people were getting answers. Uh, that was a great digital transformation for us over the last two years during COVID with MoveWorks. We call that Albot. Albot is our, our bot that solves those self-service solutions. And now it's transforming into IT, HR, facilities, accounts payable. We're going to start launching it across all our functional departments. I think the role of the CIO, as we talked about, has, has changed a lot. Probably one of the biggest changes I've seen over the last two years in particular is the cross-functional alignment between IT and HR and facilities and finance and other lines of business. You've been a CIO for 30 years. Curious to get your insights on whether you've seen that shift personally as well. Um, the need to collaborate with other lines of business much more tightly than perhaps in the past. Yes, I, I see more than ever uh, the CIO's role is to be a partner to all the corporate functions. Specifically more than ever uh, at Albemarle's case, uh, we had a new CHRO come in, Melissa Anderson, who was a big proponent of digitization as well as customer centricity and employee centricity. And as a result of that, IT and HR has been a stronger partnership than we've ever seen because we're trying to solve this new norm, this new hybrid work model. So we have to come up with more innovative ways to improve our customers' experience. But in order to do that, you've got to improve the employee experience and you've got to retain your employees and you have to attract employees. And du during this pandemic, we saw a new norm, a hybrid work model, people working from home for the most part for the first couple of years. Now we're getting back into a hybrid mode where we're working a couple of days in the office and a couple of days from home. So how do we create solutions that really help facilitate that being a productive situation? But more importantly, how do we create flexibility to maintain our culture? Um, and keep the engagement that we had prior to COVID and the pandemic. And HR and IT are partnering really strong in that space. And we're using MoveWorks as a platform to both help IT and HR to bring a common solution to our employees so they don't have to go to multiple solutions to get those answers. So they're going to one place to get HR issues and IT issues. And that's another thing we're doing. We're, we're actually using MoveWorks to do, we're driving towards making all our workflow approvals go through MoveWorks. Who wants to log into five different systems to approve five different things a different way? Nobody likes doing that anymore. Well, MoveWorks has given us a federated solution to allow us to have one platform for approvals and not have to go to five different systems for approvals. So those are the kind of things we're working on and changing the, the employee experience. 
So you, you obviously spend a lot of time on initiatives to fix um, and transform the employee experience, which I think is a trend that we've seen, you know, really take off over the last few years, necessitated, of course, by things like uh, remote working and hybrid working. Um, where does employee experience fit on the priority list? If you were to think about perhaps the top five initiatives for any CIO, where does employee experience fit on that list and what's it competing with for attention? Yeah, without a doubt right now, it's number one on the list. Um, given the, the transformation that's going on of COVID the last two years, moving into this hybrid work model, the employer experience is becoming the most important uh, focus of the company. And it's from a retention, but it's also from a recruiting perspective. And there are tools that are needed to give that type of an experience with this new hybrid model. Um, because not everybody's in the office and can engage face to face, but you're trying to make that experience as if it were in that situation. So not only, you know, better conferencing and collaboration platforms, but just better solutions that when we are engaged with video or conferencing from a hybrid perspective, we're trying to get people to use solutions like MoveWorks to make life easier for them. So they're not spending much time on those types of platforms anymore because MoveWorks is just making it easier for them. Um, so seeing a lot more trends towards those types of solutions to make it self-service oriented versus um, needing other people to, to assist them with some of the administrative tactical things. Earlier, you used the word digital transformation a few times. And, you know, I've been in the in the workplace for close to a couple of decades now, and that's not a new term. I think it's been around for uh, many, many years, but it seems to have taken on a slightly different meaning in the last few years. And as I think about me taking this call from home and quickly being able to pivot and I've got my mic set up and I've got my camera set up, it seems that we're a little more adaptable, uh, a bit more agile these days, a little bit more ready to enact plan B or a, a different scenario. Um, do you feel that that willingness to embrace change has made it easier to work on digital transformation initiatives that you have more, more freedom to make change faster? Yeah, I do. I, I think operational leaders are becoming more aware that IT is not something to keep the lights on and just get email or just do your accounting systems anymore. They're seeing digitization. Digitization is a business term. It is not an IT term. And digitization is enabling the business. It is enabling customer solutions. It's enabling manufacturing operations. It's enabling supply chain to supply chain visibility. It's, a, it's, it's driving efficiency in the back office. Digitization has become a business term with, a, with an IT flair to it, but now, operators, CEOs and COOs are seeing digitization is without a doubt at the core of helping strategy and execution from an operational and a customer perspective. So you've been serving as a CIO in and around the chemicals industry for a lot of your career. Does it blow your mind a little bit what's possible with technology these days when you look back to perhaps some of your earlier roles? Yes, I, I would say I've been around um, the industrial, uh, refinery, chemical, nuclear, process plant industry my entire life. Uh, this is how I've spent uh, my entire life, either from an engineering procurement and construction company to a process company like Albemarle, a specialty chemical company. And I would say IT has been the greatest enabler of optimizing a plant um, than anything else. Uh, you can't do that with people. You just, you cannot mine that much data with people. 
You can try to throw as many people at it as possible, but it's just humanly impossible to gather that much intelligence, that much data, volumes, terabytes of data, and be able to mine through that and make effective decisions. We've never seen these kind of capabilities that we're seeing today uh, in the past. And that insight and that capability is now, uh, and it's available now through, through the technologies that we have available to us. It's interesting because when we talk about employee experience, there's sort of the two ends of the spectrum. There's obviously, you know, as you've been talking about, there's the, the operational experience. How do you do things at scale? But on the other end, you have to be able to put yourself in the shoes of an individual end user and try and imagine what their experience is like and, and how we can make it better and how we can make it easy. What do you think making IT easy for an end user means? How, do you, how would you think about that? It's a good question. I, um, I, I take a lot of pride in getting feedback from our employees on what does easy look like. Um, but one of the simple models I, I probably have applied many times is if our employees can't find it within one, two or three clicks, if they have to go beyond that, probably, it's probably not easy. <laughs> um, you can tell how easy you're rolling things out by adoption. Adoption matters. Um, that's your probably true measurement. Uh, if you're rolling things out that are simple, simple and, and effective is how well they're adopting those solutions. But there's nothing like constructive feedback, constantly asking for server surveys and getting feedback from the employees. And I, I use the term leaning into the red. It's like, it does me no good to go before management and say we're green in every category, that our dashboards are all green. That's just telling me I'm doing good. How do I lean into the red? I change the baseline. I go from three days service level agreements to two day service level agreements. Now I'm in the red. I was in the green. We were good with three. Now we're going to two. How do I get to one? How do I get below one? And feedback surveys and leaning into the red get you where you need to be with your employees to make it simple and easy for them to use. Don't settle for good. Don't be satisfied with producing green dashboards. Wake up every day with red dashboards. You'll be better tomorrow. That's interesting. So, so I had three things there. One, adoption, going back to the concept of leading indicators, adoption is probably a great leading indicator of whether something's getting early success, at least it's getting traction. People are, are using it. Um, but that you need to marry that with surveys, feedback, qualitative feedback on what the experience is like. Um, the third piece is really interesting to me as, as someone who's in, in marketing, which I, which I heard as um, the trend is more important than the SLA. Um, you can beat an SLA, but you can, can still you can still continue to, to move the needle on performance. And it's certainly something that we think a lot about in the marketing sphere is um, you could always make things better. And, and what, what can you tweak and what can you optimize? Very true. A few questions to wrap this up, Patrick. What is one tactical thing that you think leaders can implement tomorrow or, or this week to help motivate their employees? You know, I would, um, I would say your voice of your customer and the voice of your employee is more important than it ever has been. So have tools that give you that constructive feedback so that you can deliver and probably the most important time in the history of our, uh, uh, of our lifetime. And that is coming out of this uh, pandemic and the dynamics associated with a hybrid work model. More importantly, do you have to be hyper-focused on customer centricity and employee centricity? And they go hand in hand together. Don't separate them. In order to have great customer focus, you have to have great employee focus. You can't have customer focus by itself without employee focus. It is your employees that drive customer excellence. Love it. To, very, very true. Uh, what's the best advice that you can give to a first time CIO? <laughs> um, I, I'm going to give the same advice that I um, was given 
when I first started my career with uh, Accenture, or back in the day, it was Anderson Consulting. And um, I asked the partner, I said, what, what's it take to be successful in the business world? And on the first day, he said one simple thing, and it's actually one of my laws. It, it's the fourth one of the 20. Produce more than you consume every day. So it's a simple phrase, produce more than you consume every day. But I think that applies to more than a CIO. And what I mean by that as a CIO is if you're producing more for your company than you're taking away, you're going to be successful. But that applies to everyone in life, whatever role you're in. Just produce more for your company than you take away every day. And just measure that every day and you're going to be successful. It's probably a great rule even outside of work just for our, our roles in the planet right now. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to try and teach that one to my uh, to my five-year-old. We'll see how successful well, I, I am. I have a, a, another thing that we do at home. So you bring some of these this business world into your home. Uh, so when my daughters were four and three years old and they could start writing things down, we set goals on December 26th, the day after Christmas. And they started off with 10 goals and you know things like I want to be a straight-A student I want to count to 100 before anybody in my classroom I want to say the alphabet backwards before anybody else um, and these other goals could be obtainable things like I want to have movie night with dad I you know we're gonna to go to church on Sunday we're gonna to go to Florida to the beach so those goals were very very practical early in the early ages of my my two daughters so from four to seven to 10, all of a sudden at 10, they started getting more aspirational. Let's go to Paris. <laughs> let's, you know, let's have straight A's, our whole uh, educational program. Um, I saw them grow over the years by just developing these goals. And once a year, we sit down and look at those goals on the 26th and what they accomplished the past year. And then what are they gonna set for themselves next year? And again, it gets back to that beginning with the end in mind. What do you want? Where do you want to be next year in your life? What goals do you want to have achieved? Personal, professionally, economically, technically, you know, relationship wise. Where, where do you want to be with your family? Where do you want to be with your friends, your partners, your spouses, whatever it might be? Um, that's something we still do to this day. Uh, so I've accumulated. Uh, 22 years of goals for him. I, I still have them uh, with me. <laughs> I love it. Such a fantastic story and a great example of how um, making yourself a better leader in the workplace ha has benefits in, in your personal life as well. Two successful daughters. Couldn't be more proud of them. Who is one legend that inspires you and why? Oh, that would be my mom. She's a fantastic person probably not many people know her but she um, brought me up um, uh, pretty much on her own she um, her work ethic taught me so much that uh, I might not be the smartest guy in the room but no one was ever gonna outwork me uh, because I saw how hard she worked um, and just her character her integrity and her passion and um, her sacrifice that she provided to me uh, drives me every day, still to this day. What a fantastic answer. Do you think the fact that that's your answer um, shows in the way that you lead your teams and the, and the care that you give to your employees? I, I believe it probably has something to do with it. Um, you know, if anybody knows me, I'm, I'm always uh, doing what's best for the company, not me as an individual. Uh, what drives me is I know if we take care of the company and we take care of our customers, it's going to take care of our employees. And so that's how I like to be known and remembered for is uh, he's a guy that really cares about the employees in the, in the company. And he always all his decisions that he makes is putting that first. And I think that's, uh, I, you know, I thought my mom did that for me. Patrick, thanks for spending time with me today. I've loved the conversation. Very, very insightful. 
and I look forward to hanging out in person next time we do this. Yeah, and you did very well. No coffin. That was that was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Patrick. Have a great day. Thank All right, you. Thanks, Alex.